Hey guys and welcome back to Coffee Time. Hope you're all having a great day and welcome to our Sunday show. Today I am drinking just a standard Nescafe Gold Blend again and it couldn't be a bother to make one up this evening. <laughs> Let's get into a better habit of when I'm going to film these videos so I can actually enjoy a coffee with you all. But let me know what coffee you're drinking today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Hope everyone's had a great day. Hope you've all been enjoying the bar reports we've been releasing recently. It's been really good to get back into filming and start playing some games again. And that kind of like leads us into today's video. Kind of chat about ninth edition and what i think about it you might be thinking well hey why do we kill you think well you might not but i don't care i wanted to sit and chat about ninth edition and why i like it and why i don't like it i've played five games now with five different armies some factions that i've used a lot some factions i've never used before and i just wanted to kind of like go through some of the good bits some of the bad bits and then an overall opinion about the new game i will say that i'm going to be focusing on match play because this book is absolutely humongous and there's enough to kind of like work out anyway about matched play. There's just a lot going on. So I haven't actually read the Crusade rules yet, but I did watch Winter's SEO's little rant video, which actually made, it was to say that Crusade was bad, but to me it made it sound more fun because I, I enjoy role playing, you know, and unit management sounds really fun. So if you're interested to hear like deep thoughts from a narrative player about Crusade, then make sure you check out the video and leave a link in the description just below the eBay link. Just kidding, there's no eBay link. <laughs> if you wanted like a two sentence review, this is essentially eighth edition with good terrain rules. That's what kind of like, this is what I found the game to be. I'm still getting my head around it. I've, I said, I've we've filmed five, we've done five bat reports now. Two of them you haven't seen yet. They're going to be coming out one on Wednesday to the premium members or to the small board gang members join now and then one on friday for you guys for you guys on youtube but i've, been, I've obviously made mistakes because the game feels so similar to ninth uh, to eighth edition and there's not that many changes in reality a lot of the big changes that you've seen in this rule book compared to the old one is actually in an faq or a chapter approved that's been out for eighth edition already obviously there's been some big changes like character targeting rules which i keep getting wrong obviously strategic reserves is brand new but most of the game just feels the same it feels like eighth edition but that's but that's if you're only talking about the core game itself well if you break it to just the core game the core game is mostly the same with the addition of strategic reserves and the addition of the way character targeting rules work and obviously how aircraft work which again is a little bit different but not really it's kind of like the same as what 8th edition was but now with the change of falling out and you can't shoot but now flyers still can because they're an aircraft for example and obviously you can't overwatch everything anymore it's now a stratagem it kind of feels like the same game where this really starts coming to into its own is the terrain and the missions so on the on the lead up to the announcement of ninth before this actually was officially released they kept kind of like leaking some terrain rules and there's obviously a defensible which people or dense cover which people didn't really like the look of but a lot of the terrain traits are relatively this is a really heavy book <laughs> it's like i'm working out a lot of the terrain traits are relatively straightforward but the problem it comes to is when you've got multiple terrain pieces that have multiple terrain traits train traits terrain traits and what do I mean by that? Like, so on page 264, you get 10 examples of, of types of cover, which is great. It is pretty much the only thing I've used for terrain right now. And it kind of, it breaks down some terrain pieces and gives them their own special rules. And there's 10 special rules on the previous page, which are, these are the, these are the actually the terrain trait. This isn't such a criticism, but it's the byproduct of increasing and making rules more in depth. It's that every terrain piece has three or four rules assigned to it. Like a lot of them do overlap. Like a lot of them have light cover, and hardcover and scalable and defensible etc but the problem is i think what you're going to find is when you actually start playing is you're going to forget a lot of these rules i realize this video just sounds like me feels like a cover-up for me getting all the rules wrong in some battle reports recently but hey ho <laughs> i really really like the terrain rules and i think they're really good but you might notice that i'm only really playing with a couple of terrain types i'm mainly sticking to ruins crates and craters because they are all relatively simple to get your head around things like walls and pipes and trees and stuff like that just seem to add a little bit of complexity that might be hard to get your head around at first but at the same time then i feel like that because i'm avoiding them when i do need to know them in the tournament or something i'm not going to know them which is going to be like really detrimental to myself but i think overall a lot of the terrain rules are really good 
It's just, it's just a lot. And I think that's, that's what I found with a lot of stuff in this book. It's that it's all amazing and I love it and I'm a shell. But it's just a lot to deal with all at once. So something I do with your opponent is when you're playing these games, I try and stick to these common terrain features and limit yourself to how many you use at a time. Just so when you are playing your first couple of games and are learning how to play, then you don't have to worry too much. Because like craters are relatively straightforward. They like covering difficult ground. What's that mean? Get cover save if you're in it and you're minus two to move. Easy peasy. And then like armoured containers, light cover, so that cover save once again, scalable, exposed position, so you can climb on it and you don't get a cover save. It's relatively straightforward. But if you have like a really, really complex board and you have like 10 different terrain pieces that are all like, all have their own rules, that's just loads to remember all at the same time. Like I've just realised that the three that I'm using are also the first three in the list and that's how simple I am as a person. But I think there's only been one time where I've played a game, it was the Chaos Knights versus Grey Knights one, which is on premium or for primary small board game members if you remember. You can find it in the members area right now. We used woods, but we added a rule because we had fish tank terrain essentially, the, the big jungle style terrain and we said they were woods but they were obscuring as well so if you stood behind them then you can't get seen that's how they read the real time they've actually like modified the terrain the standard common terrain features again i think this like covers most most bases there's not much here that doesn't get covered except for rocks which was quite surprising there's no like rocky outcrops which are I'd say quite common in our battle reports. A battle report that's coming on Friday, which is Necrons versus Iron Warriors for free uh, on YouTube. We uh, we just call them obscuring, so you can't just can't see over them. But there's not there's not much for that one, which is quite surprising. So but overall, I think that the terrain rules really change the game up a lot more than people might realise because of the fact that if you don't play ITC, then you've got a hell of a lot more line of sight blocking if you're using ruins, which changes the battlefield completely. Because before, if you if you're playing with like this style of terrain, like one of the example battlefields, and you're not using obscuring or you've never used obscuring before, but if you stand here, you can see someone in that corner because you can see through windows. They get a cover save, but you can see them. But well, this battlefield is so it's it's like a more like a labyrinth when it's blocked when it's all line of sight blocking, which is something I'm quite used to, but I. The fact that obscuring is just ITC bottom level blocks down a site, but better. It's like level two. I think it's. I think it works a lot better, but it can be abused at the same time. So in a battle report that's coming out Wednesday for pre members, slight spoiler. There's one situation where I'm using Imperial Guard in this battle report, and there's a big large piece of terrain, and I need to kill something on the other side of the battlefield which Dad has hidden to get some points, right? And I can't see it because of this terrain, but. What I did was I drove my tank onto this terrain piece in the middle of the board so I could see through it, which could create some re really weird situations where if you've got a unit that's really gunning, let's say, an example I've heard that's been used, Castellan robots, a big unit of robots that shoot lots, they can kind of like sit on each piece of objective in the middle of the board and because the obscuring rule doesn't work while you're in it, they can be seen but they can also see everything. Which is quite interesting compared to like ITC blocks line of sight because if they like lock down, they won't be able to see anything. But what they can do is move onto this terrain piece, lock down and then shoot anything they want because essentially most of the battlefield, they just ignore the obscuring rule because they're technically in the terrain because you just have to touch it to be within it. So I think it might create some weird nuances like that but yes, at the same time they can see you but also you can see them but also they can see you so that's a lot of daki you've got to take before you can actually retaliate. It's quite interesting. So from the terrain traits, what do you think of you got any favorites have you got anything any weird scenarios that you've already found obviously everyone's talked about dense cover but if you break it down it's relatively straightforward so where we get into the meat and potatoes of it meat and potato what a saying that is is match play so I reckon the match play rule is probably going to, well, the match play rules are probably going to be the most popular because these are designed for not only tournaments, but also for general pickup games, I guess. And what I should say that this isn't complete because the grand tournament 2020 or chapter approved is due out and that's got even more missions, which I think might address some of the issues that I've found with this book so far. But I'm speaking totally with just the rule book. I don't have a chapter approved, so we can't really comment on that. So there's 18 missions. Three of them are for 500 points, six of them for a thousand, six of them for 2000 and three of them for 3000 points. And I've only played five of the six strike force missions which are for 2000 points but that's essentially the standard game size and i've i've really enjoyed all of the missions even though they've all kind of had some similarities which is something i'm going to get onto they've all kind of felt different at the same time it's kind of like you've got a lot of similarities but they all play different as well which is cool so a lot of you might probably already know but the missions working as such you have a primary which is unique to the mission one that is used quite often is called take and hold and the primary in, in take and hold is control an objective control two objectives or control more than your opponent and you get five points for each up to 15 a turn can't do it turn one and you can score a maximum of 45 points for that and then you choose three secondaries 
and this, there's a list of secondaries and there's one unique to each mission as well and you can score 15 for each one which brings you up to a 90, 90 points and then you get 10 points of being painted which is controversy in itself but stop moaning doesn't matter <laughs> just paint your models <laughs> yeah so each each mission has its own deployment type it has its own mission deployment its own primary and its own choice of secondary i think so far what i've, what I've found the problem with the primaries is that there's f six missions and five of them all have the same one they all have taken hold there's only mission six which is vital intelligence which has domination as a primary which is the same as taken hold but it's like level two so this is hold two objectives hold three objectives and hold more than your opponent it feels very samey but this is the same issue that itc had it's where it's every mission is kill more hold more with different objective placement kill an kill a unit get a point get kill more than your opponent get two points hold an objective get a point hold more objectives than your opponent at the end of the battle round get another point for example and then and then in itc you had your own secondary well bonus point which is essentially like an extra secondary which are always quite hard to do where these missions really come into their own to make them more unique is obviously not only the objective placement and the set deployment it's the special rule that's tied in with it but mission one and two which is retrieval mission and frontline warfare don't have a special rule so i'd say they feel more similar to each other than the other missions obviously don't get me wrong they have their own secondary you can choose from but you don't have to choose that secondary so if you didn't choose the mission like secondary in two games you could potentially play the same game twice so the secondary i'll go over the secondaries before i go over the special rules but the secondaries you have two pages here this is the secondaries and you choose up to three one of them can be the one from the mission itself or you can choose three from the, the two pages and you can choose one from each like category so there's five categories one dedicated to psychers so tower they have four i think the issue that i've found with these secondaries so far is they're really hard to do and I think that's on purpose. So as I said, each secondary you can score up to a maximum of 15 points per secondary. And in ITC, you kind of found that you took a secondary because, and you could score four points for each, each time you scored it. What I found with this one is they aren't quite as easy to max out. And I think that's like, I don't know if that's an issue, a design feature, or just weird. <laughs> but let me know what you think they are. So for example, this first strike. First strike is from No Mercy, No Respite. It's an end game objective. Score five victory points and then the battle if any enemy units were destroyed in the first battle round. And score an additional three victory points if more enemy units than friendly units were destroyed in the first battle round. Already, that that is up to a maximum of eight points. So that is literally just over half the points what you could have scored for that for a secondary in that, in that slot. There's also in Purge the Enemy, the Slay the Warlord. Get six points if you kill the enemy warlord. And it just feels like it just... I don't know if it's... I can't really work it out. I can't work if, out if it's a flaw or it's a design feature of these secondaries that kind of are really hard to... You know, literally, it's impossible to max out in terms of that section of the secondary. You can obviously max out the secondary. You can kill a warlord. You can max it at six points. But that secondary slot, if you chose a different one, you could have scored 15. So it kind of hampers you before the game starts. So what I think you're going to find is a lot of people are going to build their army around these secondaries, denies the opponent getting any secondaries and getting the maximum points for it unless they take the other ones which are like battlefield supremacy which is holding objectives and being all over the board and warp craft which is casting psychic powers and stuff because before like in itc you took a big game hunter if an opponent had a lot of vehicles if they only took three vehicles that you that objective was only worth three points so you'd be like oh i'm not gonna take it but when now it's like i'm gonna take slay the warlord it literally just gives me six points which is just seems strange and i don't know again this might not be the full list. We don't have chapter approved. The grand tournament pack of 2020. Maybe that is the, the pack that goes, okay, here's a bunch of secondaries which are for tournament play. You use these. Which it could be, but I don't know. <laughs> so, as I said, so each mission has its own secondary, which pretty much, from what I've seen, can be maxed out. It's just bloody difficult. For example, mission one, which is the one that me and Elliot did with Space Marines versus Imperial Knight. You essentially score max points if you have most of your army left. So if you absolutely annihilate your opponent, you max this out. But if you don't, you don't. Then there's there's other ones. The one mission I haven't played, which is Frontline Warfare. It's just all about grabbing objectives around the board. So that one might be straightforward. But I said, like, if you don't choose the mission secondary, the first two missions definitely just feel like different objective placement. I said, I think where these missions are really come into their own is their special rule for that mission which is both a blessing and a curse for example no man's land which is a mission i played with alex it was death guard versus tyranids this has a special rule called no man's land if a unit has a pre-battle rule that allows it to set up anywhere on the battlefield you can only set up in your deployment zone and a pre-game move only allows you to move in your deployment zone it sounds really cool it's really great the problem is if you play something that relies on deep strikes such as Gene Steel the cults so or grey knights probably quite rely on it quite heavily and we played two armies that ran at each other i mean it, it was fine but in uh, other armies might struggle with this sort of mission and i think this is what i kind of like a downside to what chapter 
approved missions where with null zone where it's like invulnerable saves can't be taken in 12 of the only objective on the board because so you have to hold it so you lose your invun a lot of people didn't like it and they got annoyed at that sort of mission i don't know if the the chapter approved missions are going to have similar rules like this one i think you've kind of like you've got three ways it can go and either way doesn't isn't a fix it isn't perfect you've got no special rules at all then we're back to the problem that i initially said that mission one and two feel very samey they just feel like different objective placements special rules that are added to the game or to the mission that don't really do much so it's like they're pointless there anyway or they keep them in and there's loads of special rules like this and it just ruins every army <laughs> but yeah so i like the special rules but i can see frustration from some people if they go to a tournament and they play no man's land and they play gene steel cults they're not going to have a good time like not all of them are that like that like mission six which is vital intelligence essentially that one says if you hold an objective if you move off it you still hold it until your opponent holds it that's not a big deal that's no problem it's an addition it's like it like adds to the game it doesn't remove any army it makes some armies better it makes some armies it doesn't exactly make any army worse and like scorched earth so you can burn objectives like you could do in chapter approved the old mission you can burn up objectives as a as an action which is the special rule i can't think what i'm kind of saying is is i really enjoy the special rules but what i think if if you were if these were designed for a tournament again we don't know we don't have chapter approved 2020 if this was the design for a tournament and this these missions were in rotation i think no man's land would be taken straight out and just not used for that reason which is i think it's a shame but i understand it if that makes sense because in age of sigma you don't have like six missions like you do in 40k where it's like this is the six missions we're playing this year and then you're gonna play this no they have like a bunch that they rotate they can choose them there's like some common ones which are in every tournament because they, they'd say they are the most balanced missions they have a rotation of missions so they can kind of like mix them up and you kind of like you know you're gonna be playing one of 15 missions for example and then you can like choose from there that the organizer will choose and i'm hoping we see that with 40k because these missions aren't bad but if chatter proves bringing nine six more missions or nine more missions to the game are these going to be included in the tournament setting i just hope so but not this one <laughs> That's what I'm kind of hoping for. I'd, I'd love to see like a tournament collection that I, I as a tournament organizer can choose from and go, I want that one, that one, that one, that one, because these are the best. And I'll go, no man's land mission six. Everyone's winning with Gene the Cults. <laughs> but yeah, I'm very interested to see if Chapter Approved would add any other secondaries because I think that's going to be really good. But what I'm also scared of is codex specific secondaries, which have said that armies are going to have. I think some of them are going to be really strong by accident purely because it's new and it'll break the meta maybe but i don't know we don't we don't have any codexes yet so we can't really tell we don't have any faqs that address any rules right now and we don't have chapter approved yet so i think it's interesting and i'm really excited for competitive 40k coming up again because i am a competitive player at heart i like to joke that i'm narrative i'm known i like the story i'm in no way a narrative player if i see something that jank that's janky that can win me the game i will do it and i'm sorry <laughs> but overall i like it it has its flaws everything does we all do you have your flaws, I have mine, this guy has his. But overall, I really like this this call book as a, as a match play. I think it's, as I said, I compared it a lot to 8th edition. I'd say this is like refined 8th edition. This is what it feels like. It feels like 8th edition, but with a lot less silly stuff, let's say. Stuff that just doesn't work in the game, really. And I'm really excited for other people to pick, get their hands on it and kind of like start playing some games. Obviously, the pre-orders are gone. Been and gone now. It sounds like you can still get your book. You just can't get one of those. And I'm not really selling it. It's just an empty box. But I will say, if you're part of Small Board Gang, there's a chance to win too. So uh, more details in the description i guess but yeah there's my sunday morning thoughts about the game this week i hope you've enjoyed sitting and listening to me rant and rave about how good 40k is and how i enjoy the game i do hope you can kind of stick around and watch some of the battles because we've got another a great one coming on wednesday it's me and dan with imperial guard which i've never used my brand brand new army that i'm finally using um versus craft world eldar craft world build time which is really fun and that's gonna be available for primary small board gang members and also hellstone wargaming premium members as well as patreons i know that's a lot but join small board gang level three and we've got another great game as well it's me and elliot again we play necrons with my i've never used necrons before in ninth edition or eighth edition even and he's using iron warriors so that should be a really fun game so thank you very much for watching thank you for joining me for coffee time please like the video if you liked it if you disliked it then do let me know tell me why you disliked it and i'll i'll try and get better also tune in at 10 a.m tomorrow because there's a cool video coming subscribe if you can otherwise i love you all have a great day and i'll see you next time that was a terrible wink Bye.